the one thing I've always said which could change my my price trajectory would be a political reaction. We've just had the biggest political reaction you could have. And what have they done? They've tightened things further. And for me, if I look at price, once it breaks 100 euros again, I, this thing is just much like when we first spoke about this things, you know, it had been consolidating and then it exploded higher. It just feels the same thing. Lawson, how the devil are you? Yeah, I'm good, actually. I went, uh, just uh, came back from skiing last week in Verbier, and uh, it's bloody lucky, actually. The first snow they've had happened on the day I arrived, so we managed to ski every day. And I only managed to hit my head once, so that was good. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. Now, um, you've been on Real Vision a couple of times, but uh, just for the benefit of people, just uh, give them a bit of your background, um, just so, so they know who you are and... and then we can tee up into what we're going to talk about. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been a, an equity analyst, institutional equity analyst for 35 years, God help me. Uh, and I've been following the carbon market, the European carbon market, which we must clarify exactly what it is in a minute, um, since 2004, a year before it was kind of a started trading kind of thing. So that's what I do. That's what I've done. I got introduced to you a while ago, and you helped me get and for many people at Real Vision, the carbon trade really right. Um, a lot of people made some very good money from that trade, trading in different ways, whether it was KRBN or whether it was trading the futures contract. Um, and kind of everybody got out about the right time as well. I mean, it doesn't normally happen as good as that. But you tapped me on the shoulder recently and said, hey, listen, you need to look at this again. This is getting super interesting. So I thought it would be a great opportunity to talk about, A, the market, where you think it's going, why, and then some of the things that you're working on as well, because you're working on some interesting projects as well. So I think let's frame the carbon market first for those people who, who don't fully understand it, because everybody gets confused with carbon offsets, carbon credits, the EUTS, all of these different things. So yeah. let's get people on the right page first. Well, okay. Uh, I'll tell you what, I'll share a slide because I put this little fellow together. So this is uh, contrasting the EUAs and the voluntary carbon market. And this is where the confusion starts. Everyone tends to think of carbon as carbon offsets. In other words, it is plant a forest, grow some trees, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, that is a completely different animal to what I'm talking about. And what I'm talking about is the European Emission Trading Scheme or the European Allowances, hence this EUAs thing. Um, and that is, uh, a, for first of all, it's a massively different market. Uh, you know, we're talking about a 700 billion market, and down here is the voluntary carbon market. Uh, so it's really tiny. This thing makes a huge amount of noise because people understand let's plant a tree, uh, whereas this is a, a bit more complicated to explain. But actually, once you understand it, once you get to grips with it, it's the it's the only commodity in the world. If we call it a commodity, I call it an asset class, maybe where I have absolute understanding of what the demand side is doing and the supply side. And that's pretty unusual. I mean, I, I can't think of any other commodity which, where you can do that. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it's very different. It's much bigger. Uh, what it is about is forcing companies to reduce their pollution levels, whereas the voluntary carbon market is you may choose to offset as much or as little of the pollution of which you can produce as much as you like, uh, and it's completely up to you. So it's not and those offsets may or may not be real, and they may or may not have effect. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, they fall down on ESG metrics, they're opaque. Uh, you know, not only this, is this market much smaller, you've got to divide that into about 10,000 different projects. It really is. I mean, it, it's, it may be liquid getting in, just like an IPO, but to get out, good luck for most of those. And, and 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 there are conceptual issues about, you know, if you say, right, we're going to, this project is a 200 acre forest, uh, and we're going to plant however many trees that is, eventually, one of those trees is going to fall over and die, of course, and you have to replant. Well, that's mostly in, in all the well, in all these projects, they, they take account of that. But what they don't take account for is that that tree's fallen over, it's now decomposing, uh, and releasing the carbon back into the atmosphere. So actually, you need to plant more trees always as one tree dies. So that forest of 200 acres really should grow effectively to, to infinity. 
Uh, so to really different markets, uh, and uh, you know the, the the thing about the EU aid is, uh, or the EU emission trading scheme, as it says, it is EU. It is regulated. And I guess so one thing on regulation, right? I've, I've covered utilities for 35 years, so I've come through a lot of regulatory systems, and I don't like regulation as a rule, except when, and it only really works in your favour as an investor, is when, when, when you're back against, when the politicians are against, you know, against the wall. So, you know, for example, uh, when Brazil was running out of hydroelectric power decades ago, I had a fight with the energy minister, uh, and he, he, you know, we had a, a fisticuff via Bloomberg and Reuters and all that sort of stuff. Uh, anyway, he, he departed pretty soon when Brazil did run out of energy. Uh, and because of it, they ran out of energy. They then put in a whole raft of new regulation, which is really good for investors. Uh, and I've seen that time and again. It's, 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 and, and in this case, in the EU, what they've just done is say, look, we are super committed to reaching our 2030 climate goal. It was a 40% reduction on 1990 levels. Now they want to reduce it by 55%. And what's more, they separate that into two. Once you break that down, that EU 55% goal, you've got the non-EU ETS industries and the EU ETS industries, which are about 40% of emissions. These guys have to not reduced their emissions by 55%, but by 62%. Right, so it's an even bigger onus on these on these industries within the EU emission trading scheme. Uh, so, you know, in a nutshell, every single year the level of auctions of these European allowances come down all the way to twenty thirty. So that bucket available to industry shrinks and shrinks and shrinks and shrinks, uh, which means if demand doesn't do very much, i.e., emissions don't do very much, and it'll take time for them to come up with new. Uh, technologies and so on for, to facilitate that, then you get a tighter and tighter market, uh, forcing the price up. And just one final thing so that people understand is that every 30th of April, if you're one of these industries, you have to go cap in hand to your government and say, right, forgive me, I have polluted 10 million tons of carbon, uh, to which you then have to deliver these 10 million European allowances, carbon allowances, which you've either got for free in part and purchase via auction or other means, and you have to deliver those 10 million to your government. And if you fail, there's punitive penalties. So everybody's essentially forced to buy this, which drives up the prices because the supply keeps going down. And in theory, it creates the behavior or the economics to force these polluters to find different forms of energy use. That's yeah. the basic idea, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And even more interestingly, they didn't make this an internal market. They made it a tradable market as well. Yeah. Yeah. And what what is the mechanism for trading currently these credits? Or the is it it's not a credit though, is it? It's a Don't call it credit because I'll spank you. <laughs> that's right. I keep saying the wrong word. <laughs> it's an allowance. It allows you to pollute. Right, uh, a credit is to offset what you produce, kind of thing. That's the other tiny little circle I talked about. Um, yeah, I mean the mechanism for trading is that well, basically about half of the total uh, allowances each year, or that that bucket, if you like, are given away for free, uh, which in practice means that industry, well, power gets zero, and they're about half the emissions, or a bit more actually. Uh, they get no free allowances, and then industry gets about eighty-five percent. Um, but overall, it's about half and half in, in percentage terms. Uh, so you get your free allowances, and then you've got to go and buy. And you buy because the EU has almost daily auctions, uh, and that facilitates the market, so you can go and buy them that way. Or you may buy them from somebody else or whatever, but then you start getting this market. And financial uh, participants are, are encouraged uh, with the view that you know, that facilitates liquidity, it facilitates price discovery, and so on. There's always going to be some, you know, politicians, politician out there saying, oh, the carbon price has gone up, I blame financial investors. Uh, but it's, it's very short sighted and stupid. Uh, and actually, it's not even true. Because uh, if you think about, you know, you've got all these major companies, you've got Shell, you've got RWE, you've got Uniper, all these guys, 
to all oil companies, all chemical co- chemical companies worth their salt in terms of size, and power companies have trading desks. So guess what? They trade, right? And they are also speculating. So to just say, oh, it's financial investors, it's, it's gobbledygook. But there is a futures contract, so people can invest in this, and then there's yes. other mechanisms. Yeah, we'll come you, on to that yeah. all a bit later. Yeah. Hi, I'm Raoul Pal, the CEO and co-founder of Real Vision. The financial world is a complicated world right now. It's a really complicated macro picture, and there's a lot of risks. Real Vision and our YouTube channel help you navigate those risks. So subscribe now to the channel and never miss an update. There is simply too much going on. So subscribe now. Thank you. The industries that are currently involved in the scheme, and we talked in the past about potential expansions. Talk us through that universe and you know whether it expands further as well. Yeah, I mean it's not it's not super exciting. Um, we're we're basically from twenty twenty four going to have aviation fully in. At the moment, they're in this kind of parallel universe, uh, and then we're going to have maritime come in as well. Um, it, it, the the easiest way to think about the EU test which industries are in and out is to think about the ones which are out, which is transport, building, and agriculture, and the ones which are in it. Most importantly, as I said, is power. Uh, but then you've got oil and gas, you've got chemicals, you've got mining, you've got metals, uh, you've got cement, uh, glass, uh, and I think that's about it. Maybe one I'm missing, but whatever. To, to answer your question, sorry, is, is, is that, I mean, maritime and, and aviation are coming in. So it's, it's coming in, but it's really kind of immaterial. It's like 1% additional to emissions. And they're coming at a, at a net deficit anyway, so, yeah. So last year... We had a huge upset in the European power markets, energy markets, and everybody thought that the European governments would walk away. Now, we haven't talked about the European governments are actually incentivized to to have this because they get a share of the revenues, right? So they're incentivized for this scheme to work. Talk us through what happened last year and whether the structure changed and why this might lead us into where you think this is all going. Well, we had two events uh, yesterday. Of, uh, yesterday, we had two events last year of, of major significance. Uh, Putin uh, and the price went from ninety-eight down to fifty-five in pretty short order, uh, and that was really Putin telling his cronies, "You got three days to get your money back via SWIFT, otherwise you're stumped." Uh, so there's mass selling. We had two huge, huge orders, uh, four hundred and three hundred million back-to-back on day one kind of thing, and that just got a domino effect all the way down. Uh, And that was purely trading. Uh, So then it recovered, went back up to 98. Uh, You called it uh, to get out around that level, uh, quite rightly, or very, very fortuitously, not fortuitously, very uh, cleverly. (laughs) Um, And and then we had uh, a further fall down to about 65, right? So 33% or so. And that... It was all about the EU saying, hang on a minute, you know, we've got to change completely our energy consumption because now we're not going to import gas from Russia and so on. Uh, we, as a result of importing that gas or not importing the gas, they have to ramp up and go backwards and use coal to produce carbon, which is twice as much emissions as, as gases and so on. Uh, so the EU said, right, we need to come up with a formula uh, to sort this all out, and they called it Repower EU. And Repower EU uh, needed to raise about 700 billion, uh, sorry, 240 billion, um, and that is all destined to help innovation, help renewables, you know, sort of cleaner technologies and so on. And they decided uh, that they wanted 20 billion out of the EU emission trading scheme, and that freaked the market. Uh, and a lot of people like you said, you know what, they're tampering them out. The upshot of all that uh, is that they are going to get the 20 billion, uh, but they're going to get it not from additional supply, which was the big concern, i.e. just printing money, uh, but they're just going to front load some of the auctions from the back, from the end of the decade to 23 to 26. Uh, and that to me is absolutely fine. Uh, I don't, I don't in principle like it, but I get these are really exceptional circumstances. They have said they are exceptional circumstances, uh, and therefore it's not a repeatable thing unless we have some cataclysmic event, of course, which will affect everything, not just carbon. 
Um, but I don't see that happening as it stands. So, so for me, uh, to put it into numbers, we're talking about a 4% additional or front loading, I should say, of supply uh, on you know, deficits of 20 to 30% per annum. So it has a small impact, but it's not a big impact. And additionally, I mean, the total of that 20 billion is it, it, it's a funny thing because it's a, a revenue number. It's kind of daft because, yeah, at today's price, that's two hundred and fifty million uh, allowances. I almost said credits. <laughs> that's two hundred fifty million allowances, right? Um, but if you double the price, that halves. And so, if my price pr my price forecasts are correct, and so far they've been reasonable, uh, then actually the amount of volume is going to be two percent, not four percent. So it's, it's it's funny because the markets at the moment not really thinking about that. Just I don't know, don't know what they're thinking about, but that's it becomes less and less relevant. But where we are at this at this moment in time, this is not the only thing they've been doing. They've also at the same time been uh, tweaking everything to make sure that that fifty five percent target, which the EU ETS is sixty two percent, is reached. So we've got a, a tightening of a number of things. We've got more uh, uh, less auctions coming through from twenty twenty four. Uh, we've got to step down as well. Uh, so all of this has been uh, gone through through the through the political process, which essentially required three parties to agree: the council, parliament, and commission. And that's called the trilogue. And the trilogue finally reached agreement at the end of last year. Uh, and now there's a rubber stamping process which will probably be in the next know, eight weeks, nine weeks kind of thing before we clear it out. And then it says bang and law. So if I summarise it all up, I say the market got spooked about additional supply. The EU didn't do that. Uh, they front-loaded. Uh, so, yes, there's extra supply now, but less in the, in the future kind of thing, so from a DCF point, kind of neutral, if you like. Uh, but the bottom line is that the EU, in the face of the worst social and economic uh, situation we've had for a very long time has absolutely stuck to its guns on climate. Thank God. So they basically said, if we don't accelerate or just continue the path of what we're doing, we're always going to be beholden to the energy producers. So therefore, we just have to keep going. That's essentially it, right? which was what I was hoping would be the outcome and I thought might well be the outcome. So how does that leave the market now? So let's look forward at the market for 2023 and 2024 because you've got some pretty strong views on it that I think are pretty interesting. Uh, well, it's tight, uh, is the bottom line. Um, so if you look at this fellow here, so this is um, the supply deficit uh at a price of 80 euros. Of course, if, as I said, if the carbon price goes up, this looks even worse uh, because there's less uh, front loading. Um, but, you know, you're looking at a, a huge deficit for 2022. I say for 2022 because that, as I said at the start, uh, is, is, is 30th of April when you have to comply. Uh, next year is even worse. Well, not even worse, it's cumulatively worse. Uh, and you have to think about this cumulatively. Um, because of the way the penalty price works. Do you want to go through that? Yeah, I think so, yeah. because normally it's rate of change that matters, but you're saying it's cumulative here. Yeah, because cause the you know, the way the penalty price works is that when you go to your government on the, on the 30th of April and you've got 10 million uh, carbon emissions, which have been audited, by the way, uh, then you have to deliver 10 million European allowances. But if you're short, let's, let's say you've got none, uh, then you have to face you face a penalty of paying 121 euros on each one, and still have to deliver them the following year. So you either deliver this year or deliver next year with a penalty, or finally go to jail, kind of thing. Uh, so the the psychology is interesting there because it means that um, if you know this year is basically saying there's 42 percent short, so that means that you next year not only are having to, uh, to cover the 29% uh, shortage of that year, but you're also having to deliver uh, the previous year's level, right? So on it goes, which is why we end up with a, well, 
we're going to break. And that's the fine of 121 million euro, uh, 121 euros. What happens if the the allowance price goes above that? Because it's not cheaper to just pay the fine. Well, uh, no, because you're okay. So you've got to take into account. So let, let's th- talk about opportunity costs, right? So here we are today. Uh, I'm 42 percent short. Uh, and I know that I'm going to have to pay uh, 121 euros uh, fine come 30th of April if I don't cover that. Uh, then what am I going to do? I'm going to, I'm going to try and buy these uh, allowances until the price gets to 121. Right, that's my opportunity cost phase one. But then I realise with the price now trading at 121 uh, in April, I'm still short. Right, so therefore my opportunity cost is not just the penalty price but also the allowance, which I still have to buy for delivery the following year. So my opportunity cost has gone from 121 plus 121, because that's where the allowance is now trading, to 242. But when you get to that point, the price is trading 242, you're still short, uh, you're facing a penalty of 121, and the price of these allowances is now 242, and you realise actually... You know, the opportunity cost is the sum of those two, which is 363. And that logic just goes on and on and on into infinity. Uh, so so that's why, you know, as we come on to pricing, uh, I think that's, you know, there's a lot of upside to come. So the market remains in shortfall from your, from that chart you were showing us for a significant period of time now. Yeah. 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 I mean, all the, all the, all the way through. Uh, you know, it, 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 it flattens out a bit here and then sort of takes a, a further dive here. And that's because of the uh, the back loading or the front loading, I should call it, uh, where we took uh, auctions out of here and put them into here. Uh, and then, of course, that becomes a bit tighter there. Uh, but, you know, this is all a moving pri- uh, moving feast. As I said, you know, if, if we uh, put in a, a higher price here, um, then we'll see that, you know, these prices will... Uh, the, the, the supply curve will, will come down a bit because you know, you're auctioning less uh, or bringing forward less auctions. How does the demand side relate to GDP? Does does the fall in European GDP make a difference or not really? It's pretty consistent. Um, the the thing about demand is is that you can tit around with plus or minus 10% in demand if you want. I mean, GDP is, is the underlying driver, particularly or industrial production, to be more uh, correct, uh, of, of emissions from, from industry. Um, but at the end of the day, this is a supply story, okay? And this, I'll show you this. So, so here you've got the actual deficit uh, for each year. Uh, and here is this MSR mechanism, which is a the reduction, additional reduction in supply to tighten the whole system, which the EU put in place in 2019. Uh, uh, and this is clearly the biggest driver of the deficit, right? It's, it's always, you know, it's, it, I could show you with different numbers. So I was, I was trying to get a chart which shows clearly what is the driver of the deficit, and it's this uh, market stability reserve mechanism, the MSR. Which is the forced shrinkage of the allowances? Yeah, you, you've got two. You've got two shrinkages going on. Uh, you've got the annual uh, reduction all the way to twenty thirty, uh, which, as I said, has now been speeded up. Uh, but then, under certain circumstances, if there's too many allowances or or a given a level of allowances uh, in the market, you get this mechanism kicking in, uh, and they put this place in January twenty nineteen. Uh, after a four-year deliberation uh, because they wanted to get the carbon price up uh, because it wasn't doing anything for the last last 15 years. Uh, So this has now kicked in, and it's kicked in big time. I mean, huge amount. Yeah, look at that. That's 40% of demand being taken out of the system in the the form of supply. It's huge, huge. So it, this is a supply story. You know, people can muck around and say, oh, you know, today's a bit colder uh, or, or, you know, there's a bit more gas and therefore we're going to be able to produce gas instead of coal, less emissions. It, it's it's just noise. It's absolutely irrelevant when you've got this supply I don't know, siphon going on. So how does price evolve from here then? So here's what I think at the moment. Uh, this is the history. It's kind of, I thought I'd just flag that. Um, I had two good calls. So I said carbon's going to go to zero back in 
January 2006, which it literally went to uh, 11 months later, and I turned bullish here down at eight. But despite being tempted to, to call a 10-bagger and, and walk away, uh, <clears throat> I still think there's a huge amount of upside, right? So what I put in here is you've got uh, the historic price and, and the plus and minus or high and low, which uh, it achieved. And then going forward is my forecast as a base case, but with a range, right? Um, uh, and the reality is that the, the, the downside range maybe is, is more of a technical range, uh, but the upside is, is vast. And I mean, this could happen, you know, here in 2023, we, could, we can go ballistic uh, once this whole idea of the infinity concept, concept starts biting. Um, so, you know, I just, I, I just think there's, 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 there's there's upside a because uh, just doing the maths, like the infinity argument. Uh, there's upside because at today's price, industry are not reducing their emissions, so you need a higher price, uh, and that's been corroborated by the likes of, likes of BASF, uh, the the chemical leading chemical company, saying they need to see 140 euros to to make it worthwhile to invest in in, in carbon emission reduction, which means they want to see it above 140 and consistently so before they do anything, um, just as one example. Uh, so, so i.e. the penalty's not big enough yet to matter? Well, the funny thing, yes, although I'd, I'd, I'd use a slightly different word because the, 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 the penalty is just the 121. Uh, Sorry, but, yeah, the, but, but, price yeah, the, the financial is cost is not, is not big enough. And, and don't forget, you know, these, the, the industry, I mean, not power, but industry, are getting eighty five percent free allowances, which which means that their their actual cost is fifteen percent times the the current carbon price. So you know fifteen times eighty is what sort of twelve or so. It's, it's peanuts. So they do not have a sufficient uh, cost to take on board yet. And so this is the bit I've never understood. If everybody knows where it's going, because Lawson's going around the world telling these people, and they go, "Yeah, I get it." Why do they not front load all this stuff and buy as much as you can at this price? This this is the th the thing I never really understand with their behaviour in this. Well, I mean, the, you, you could look at this, right? So uh, the, the, there's two reasons. One, one is stupid behaviour, um, or well, this, from an industrial point of view, uh, they don't all know this, uh, and and they are. I was speaking to somebody yesterday. You know, what what are these SMEs doing? Uh, so that way, they typically start buying in February for the April thing. That's what they do every year. Like, geez, why don't they not buy during throughout the year? It'd be much cheaper. Oh well, that's the mentality, right? Or they wake up when they have the the accounts audited for the end of December and or to say, hey, you haven't covered your carbon costs. Oh, right, I better go and buy those. But it's it's for some of these guys, it's it's an incidental cost, right? Um, but right, then there's this right. other thing here. So this is uh, the the total number of allowances in, in circulation, but adjusted for the fact that you have uh, companies hedging, uh, you know, locking in their forward positions or, or locking, you know, a, a utility offering a long term contract or three years, say, to a customer, uh, and immediately goes and, and locks in the gas price and the carbon price uh, by buying the carbon. So it says, so although there are about 1,500 million allowances floating around in the system I, from being issued in the past but not being used for compliance, so it's in your balance sheet, if you like, um, uh, you've got to then adjust this and to work out what's going on. The, the reality is that uh, you, you have had surplus float in the system. This is why the MSR was created, to, to reduce this. Um, Oh, that, that mechanism which comes in each year. Um, and and now we're getting to a position where actually we're dipping into the red. Uh, so you combine that uh, together with uh, the, the, the actual deficit, the trading deficit. Yeah, if, if there's a, this trading deficit, if, if we were back in, you know, this area here, you say, well, who cares about it? Whether well, it's an annual deficit, I can cover it with, with stuff in my pocket or my balance sheet. Uh, but that's not happening anymore, and that's getting tighter and tighter. And yeah, there's a bit of discrepancy. You can play around with the numbers here, and you probably float it around a bit. Uh, but we're getting to the point where no matter what float you do, uh, you are in a very pretty tight situation. 
So, so I think in answer to your question, you know, there's there are two things going on. There's the, uh, you know, the guys who, who well, there's there's this tightening coming through, uh, and also the lack of realization or just don't care because the cost is not that important. Uh, that these companies are just buy at whatever the price is or whatever point that is. So all in all, that's why I think this thing is is going up north. So I, I guess. Therefore, the power guys are more on top of it because it's a bigger part of their cost because they don't have the the free credits, right? Yeah, that's true. Um, although, ironically, they pass it through. Uh, and I, I suspect the industry will do that too. So ultimately, it's going to be, yeah, I was going to say you and I, but since you're on the Caymans, no. But uh, at least <laughs> I, I will pay for it. <laughs> right, so it's an increased cost of goods in the end. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's not that easy because uh, if you have import competition, you can't just pass that on. Uh, but that's now we're getting to we're getting into a whole new other uh, thing. But yeah, over over time, this this kind of interesting. So if, so the the EU is very cognizant of this partly because the industry have lobbied big time, but they know that uh, if they if they're competing against uh, imports. Uh, then clearly it's unfair if those guys are not on the same carbon footing. Uh, so the EU is implementing this thing called the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, CBAM for short. And what that allows is a, uh, or what it facilitates is that any import into the EU will have to have a notion of carbon cost applied to it so that the goods... So it's a, ta- a tariff, essentially. Yeah, tariff, tariff is a good way of seeing it because it's not a tax because they managed to get around that as a tariff, yes. Um, uh, and that is is good for two reasons. One, it protects or puts industry on on an even footing with imports. Uh, and secondly, of course, all those revenues go, guess where, to the EU. The free allowances are going to come down because you can't say, oh, we're going to protect you and we're going to still give you free allowances. You've got to be the same with the importers, right? And that means that this whole market... Is, is is just beginning to go woof. I mean, that 700 billion I talked at the, mo- at the start is, is going to go ballistic. So, yeah, so the free allowances are disappearing as well. So it's kind of three ways supply is contracting here and it, it creates a quite an unbalanced market. Um, before we go into price projections and stuff, is this not very inflationary for everybody in Europe? Having just gone through a, you know, a massive inflationary period... If you're driving up carbon credits, that carbon carbon allowances, stop saying credits, uh, carbon allowances to, you know, 200 euros, does the man in the street not pay that? Or does that get offset by fiscal on the government side because they all rake in the cash from it? Uh, I mean, yes to both. Um, but, you know, we've had a lot of noise uh, this last year uh, with... You know, politicians talking about the carbon price being high, blah, blah, blah. The impact on the electricity price of the higher carbon price versus the higher fuel costs is like 3%. Gas price and the coal price have gone ballistic. Now, that is a huge driver of the electricity price. But, of course, it's not just electricity. It'll be other goods as well. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there will be an inflationary component, of course there is. But it's very mar- what you're saying. It's still pretty marginal, really, in the overall cost of a good. Given where we are today, yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it, it'll be, it'll have an impact. But you know, what are we trying to do? Save the planet. There is a cost, or well, there's a cost for all the pollution we've done for the last centuries. Yeah. So the market has been choppy sideways now for a while, right? After having the initial sell-off. It kind of went up, came back down again, choppy sideways. What is your view for the next two years? What do you think? You know, you've got the model where theoretically it can go, but what's your hunch in this? Oh, it, it, it goes up. I, I'm I'm being um, reserved, uh, unlike me, um, in in putting what I wrote for you. I mean, I will put what I wrote for you on on social media at some point, uh, but I don't want to put it there yet because I realise that. The EU follows me. <laughs> I, don't, yeah. I don't think that's sinister, but I think that they follow me. <laughs> may, who knows? Maybe it is. Um, and therefore, I don't want to crow that this is fantastic. Let's go, lads, before they've finally signed on the dotted line. It's a rubber stamping exercise, but you know, you never know. 
Uh, and they made, yeah, maybe I'm being silly, maybe uh, you know, they won't give a shit what I say. Uh, maybe I should just put it out there at some point. Uh, so I'll, I'll judge that. But um, uh, I don't want to rock the boat and again start thinking about, ooh, the price could go through the roof and everything else. Okay, but we can imply from what you're saying that you think the price goes through the roof. <laughs> yeah, I think it does. I mean, it's, it's like, as I said, the demand is the only commodity where well, it's the only, it's probably the, the most uh, uh, stable or comfortable I've ever been in, in forecasting 35 years because I know the demand and the supply. And so just do the maths. I mean, it's, it's, and what it's, gets interesting is, is they rubber stamp this process now. That gets done in eight weeks, so call it end of March. By end of April, everyone's got to scramble to do what they need to do. So you'll get a price signal from the EU sometime end of March or whatever, and then a, a demand signal as people have to cover last year's allowances. So it starts to get to a very interesting period, I guess. Yeah, I think it does. I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's always... Uh... I don't know, maybe there's things companies can do and so on, but I, I, I think the reality is if you're really waiting for rubber stamping uh, as a as an industrial, then something's not quite right. Uh, so in other words, yeah, we're short now. We're coming into the final furlong of compliance, uh, added to which you will have the EU uh, rubber stamping the process. But you're short now. I mean, so maybe there's some some element of 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 the of the free of the allowances in the system, which yeah. If I go back, let me show you with the charts. Probably easy to show you what I mean. Um, but if we go back to this fellow here, you know, this twenty percent shorter to have twenty twenty two. Maybe that's five percent. Maybe it's ten percent. Or maybe it's a bit more. I don't know. But the, the, there is some flex in that number. So. There could be some element which is covering, you know, the, the, the deficit for that year, right? So you've got to look at these two charts in, in conjunction. Uh, but we're definitely going to a massive shortage, you know. So at what point do you start pricing that in or what point does do, do corporates begin to understand that? Well, they'll understand it because you won't have the allowances in the market, right? So this is the thing about carbon. It's... it's, it's, it's you know, everyone loves to have a specific target, a specific date and everything else. But this is something that's going all the way up, right? It's like ether, right? Your your favorite baby. You know, that's <laughs> to, to try and time it. To, if you look back, well, look, I mean, look back in for the last five years, if you'd, not great this year because I've done that, of course, but you'd, you'd say, well, you know, I wish I wasn't farting around worrying about $1 or $2 back in 2016. Mm -hmm. Right, because then I missed the boat going all the way up. That's the kind of thing. And so, so you know, when people ask me, what, you know, is, is now the right time? Well, it, it it is fundamentally, absolutely. You may get a better price, but then as you might. As long as your time wait. horizon is long enough. Yeah, yeah. It's all about time horizon. Also, what's interesting to me is we threw a really terrible situation at this market. And the best we could manage was a 30% correction or 40% correction but that lasted literally a few days. But realistically, we threw the worst case scenario at Europe, which was exploding energy costs, no ability to import the fuels that they needed, all of this stuff. And the market basically dropped from, well, 100 bucks and stabilized around 80 bucks. So it tells you the risk reward of that market, considering you already said it's. It was a 10x before then. So I, I like to see the risk reward of a market over time. And you can see what the risk reward is here. I don't see when I think through this, you know, I'm a simpleton. When I think through this, I think, OK, what could now change the price structure to create a bear market in this? I can't see it. So what we got was a flat market was the best was the worst case scenario was a flat market twenty percent we can call that a flat market after such large gains. No, exactly, and and the, and this is the, the the thing is is that you the one thing I've always said which could change my my price trajectory would be a political reaction. We've just had the biggest political reaction you could have, and what have they done? They've tightened things further, and for me. If I look at price, 
once it breaks a hundred euros again, I, this thing is just much like when we first spoke about this things. You know, it had been consolidating and then it had exploded higher. It just feels the same thing. You know, you spend a year and a bit consolidating sideways, and you've got all of this positive supply and demand fundamentals. It's going to get hugely interesting. At worst, it does like a nice 10, 15% a year. It's kind of like a yield. But at best, do that. it like becomes that. super interesting indeed. It's, a, you know, 100%, 200%, 300%, whatever from here over time. Yeah, and it's, it's not going to be a 10, 15% per annum thing. This thing goes woof and probably goes way woof and then, you know, has a, has a correct bit. But, uh, and have you found any correlation with this trade? Why I love this trade and why so many people loved it before is just not correlated. In a world of risk on, risk off, everything's the bloody same, you know, and you just choose your horse you want to bet, you know, this seals, feels like it's non-correlated. People said it was correlated with that gas price and stuff. Nah. Have you found any correlation with anything, really? No. This has no correlation uh, worth speaking of with other asset classes. Uh, so I thought I'd put it against your favorite one. <laughs> um, but you can take your asset class, pick your asset class, uh, and its correlation is peanuts. I mean, it's like 0 0.2, 0 0.3. Uh, so so as a, from a portfolio uh, point of view, it is fantastic. I mean, it's, 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 it's a, a lowering risk asset, which is going up. I mean, why on earth wouldn't you have that in your portfolio? Yeah, and you've just priced in the worst possible news. This is what I find so interesting. So talk to me about the new business you're involved in. Well, I always call it here. Kabuki, because it sounds like Kabuki Theatre because you're involved in it, but it's not. It's Kakubi. <laughs> tell me about it. <laughs> I will always get it wrong. Um, tell me about it. Well, Kakubi is pretty exciting. I, I you know, I, I sort of gave, gave up the day job uh, analysing uh, utilities, which I got bored of, although it did reasonably well uh, about a year ago. Um, but, uh, you know, so I, I could go do whatever I wanted and I took time off and played around a lot. But I, I had about, it's insane. I had about 20 job offers, uh, thinking, where were you when I needed you? <laughs> uh, but, um, one of the guys who knocked on my door, these guys, um, uh, who didn't have a name at that stage, but Kakubi. And the whole point of, of, of Kakubi, uh, is to, uh, uh make it, make carbon trading uh, EUAs available to everybody. You try and buy carbon today, uh, and it's really difficult. Um, you know, the financial investors who are savvy and so on can probably do it, and you can buy an ETF. But the problem with ETFs, with most of them, is that they are, they are futures, right? And if it's a future, you're having bugger all impact on the market uh, itself, or at least if you own physical, which is what we're doing, uh, then you can have an impact on the price and therefore uh, on, on on effectively forcing you know, pollution reduction uh, because you're taking one of those allowances out of the bucket and industry then have to scramble and you know push a price up or reduce their emissions uh, so so it's very simple um, you know we've got a 700 billion uh, market for the EUAs uh, as I said earlier um, and you can just go to our website and say, right, I want to uh, mint uh, an EUA and create a Kakubi token. Uh, so we have the Kakubi token and segregated and backed one for one by EUAs. So if you've got a million tokens, you've got a million EUAs, and you can also redeem them. Uh, so so that's that's the, the, the first stage. The second stage, and, and that is highly liquid, by the way, because... You got seven hundred billion, right? So you can, you know, mint and, and redeem all day long. The second stage will be to have the Kakubi tokens, where people start trading their tokens as well. Um, and then, the, and on top of that, because we built it on on your favorite platform, uh, Ethereum, we can uh, have composability, right? So we have a number of people talking to us at the moment. One wants to create a DAO. Uh, somebody else wants to, you know, we've got SMEs who perhaps we have a product for them who want to trade. Um, I buy carbon better and at cheaper prices. Uh, you can have, uh, you know, a, an app on your phone. Somebody can create that, which says, hey, you know, you've just gone to Sainsbury's. Uh, you spent so much uh, seven miles away from home. So your carbon footprint is X. Do you want to offset? Yes, please. 
and immediately you get a Kakubi token, uh, which is not only offsets what you've just done, uh, but also is a fantastic investment. And this is the great thing. This is really the the one time you can have your cake and eat it, right? So if you want to uh, uh, you know, have an investment and be green, you can do it. The reality for by and large is that most people, when it comes down to it, care more about the investment than being green. Um, but this gives you a bloody good investment and green at the same time. Uh, so, you know, you can reach whichever way you want to be with one of those, but you get both anyway. And so also for people who are interested in price, they can just go and buy the token, stick it in their wallet, hold it and sell it when they think the price has reached their target. So it's a sure. simple mechanism for anybody to buy and sell, but it actually does physically remove the carbon allowance. So that is positive yeah. overall because you're actually driving change and then because it's it's built on top of ethereum and it's composable people can do other stuff with it yeah which becomes interesting in itself yeah 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 no, one, exactly. one of the things that i've always thought about is once you tokenize this stuff there's a lot of companies that want to be net zero but they have to plant forests and do stuff that's kind of non-specific but basically you know and i use the example even though transport is not part of it but if Amazon wants to be net zero, they can basically, every time they deliver something, it can automatically you know, have a, a token toll system. So it automatically pays exactly the right amount. So it doesn't have to overpay. It doesn't need a big trading desk to do it. It just kind of automatically creates the tar carbon. Same with planes. Yeah, exactly. Or, 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 or Amazon pings you a text, say, by the way, do you want to offset that? you will have a fantastic investment. Click here, bang. There's so many uses. There's so many, it's just insane. It's like, oh, we have music guys get in touch with us because they want to create this thing where they burn the NFT, you know, they get a token, they burn the NFT, which is linked to the token, and then the token therefore means a permanent reduction of the, or it's effectively, if you imagine you've got- Yeah, can you destroy the tokens? Yes, you can you Can, can you burn destroy them. that? You can, burn, you can burn. No, no, no! Don't destroy the allowance. Don't want to do that because uh, because the it's getting nerdy, but or even more nerdy. <laughs> uh, but the MSR mechanism looks at the total number of allowances in circulation, and if they're above a certain threshold, takes them out. If you destroy that and bring that level below, then the MSR doesn't kick in. So we keep the, keep the allowance in perpetuity when you burn the token. Oh, okay. So you don't get rid of the allowance, but you get rid of the token, and therefore that allowance can't be used yeah. by the market. So the market's yeah. in shortfall by that amount. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Has industry seen what you're doing, and how are they thinking of this? My guess is, as you said, you're going to see a lot of music, entertainment, a lot of people there, because it becomes a very simple mechanism for them to drive change, which they're very keen to do. Do you see it elsewhere? I mean, how are people looking at this? Uh, we um, through and by, by the way, I should say something. Um, you know, we are not uh, about hiding, uh, about doing this in a dodgy jurisdiction, uh, about being anonymous. Um, that's not our style at all. So we've spent a fortune on lawyers' fees. We are fully compliant with Swiss law and regulation, uh, and clearly we're not anonymous. Um, so, so, so we do have also. Uh, a very interesting access to 140,000 small and medium enterprises. Uh, so we are going to be talking to them to see exactly how we can uh, uh, knock on the door and and sort of uh, get them to trade and, well, ultimately buy carbon at a better price and more smoothly throughout the year and, and with some kind of algorithm which says now's the time to buy, now is not the time to buy kind of thing. Uh, so that's just another idea. There are so many ideas floating around. Uh, so, and what about regulatory compliance for U.S. investors? Is it deemed a security, or you know, how does that how's that all work? Yeah, I mean, they, they, at the moment, we have uh, anybody who's a professional investor or corporate can invest. Uh, we anybody who's a Swiss uh, for retail, it's Swiss at the moment. Uh, and we are putting through a prospectus, which we, we're, we're through drafts at the moment. So in the coming weeks, we'll be able to have uh, European 
uh, retail as well. Uh, so U.S. retail is another thing. At that point, we've got to go through the SEC, et cetera. So, you know, we'll, we'll, when we have more funds, we'll, we'll be pursuing that one. But that's it. Yeah, that's so it. right now, you have to be really that kind of credited investor. You know, yeah. you have to be a experienced investor currently to be able to buy. Yeah. I mean, it sounds really, really interesting. I think it's, you know, I've seen a lot of these tokenized carbon schemes, and most of them don't stack up because they're because they are carbon credit. credit. Correct. They're <laughs> credits. They are um, offsets of different ways. Um, they are not necessarily compliant. They are opaque in nature. There's a whole bunch of issues with them. And sure, there's some good ones within all of that, but it requires a huge amount of work. It's less liquid, all of this stuff, and less clear. Now, for people who can't buy the token, because we have a large US audience, how do they... And there's the futures contract, which a lot of people have used before, and you know, interactive brokers and your usual brokerages all have the EU ETS. There is uh, there's some ETFs now. There's the KRBN, again, which you said trades on the futures contract. So if the futures contract moves up and down versus spot, and we've seen that, you know, according to supply and demand, um, it varies somewhat. So there's a KRBN. There's another ETF, I think, in Europe now as well, isn't there? Yeah, there is. Um, well, you've got to, uh, I think there's a, is it a UBS one, um, pretty liquid. Uh, there's another one which is uh, Spark Change. Um, uh, they are also physical, but they're an ETF, um, and they they're more expensive than doing this. I mean, if you if you've got a crypto wallet, this is a no brainer. Um, if you're if you're just simply going off the price with a non crypto uh, wallet, then you can play the KRBN or the Spark Change. Yeah, or the futures contract. Lawson, fascinating. Let's see how this plays out. But it's just. You know, it's really interesting. And for me, just sitting to you, talking to you and just thinking what we've gone through and all the apocalypse that could have happened in this market and it didn't actually go anywhere, that's a big sign. <laughs> no, I think it's absolutely huge. Yeah. Um, I'll just say if, if, you know, for any of you guys out there who wants to, uh, you know, participate in, in, in the Kakubi story, just reach out to me and uh, if you've got ideas or contributions, whatever it is, uh, feel free to reach out more than happy to entertain of course yeah we've got a huge network of people doing interesting stuff and i think people yeah. are going to be interested in you mm. know just even just affiliating this to nft projects or whatever it is where it automatically does this it's great and you can buy fractions so you don't have to pay the full exactly, exactly. so you can buy whatever it is so you can offset whatever it is in whatever amount you can say i want to put ten dollars in right and therefore you get ten dollars yeah. so if you're trying to do the other uh, you know the the spark change or whatever you've got to do it in blocks of eighty dollars, uh, for example. Yeah, yeah. but you know, there's it's, it's just so many different users. You, you imagine you've got gamers, right? You've got a million eyeballs uh, are playing games at one one any point in time. You say, right, yeah, you know, here, click on that. You've offset, bang, well, hey, but it's just it's just mind blowing what you can do with this. Exciting, fascinating. So listen, good luck with this. Let's see what happens to the price as well. But, uh, you know, it's really interesting that you've gone down now, both the crypto rabbit hole, got out of the investment bank world finally, <laughs> and uh, are free to do some interesting stuff. So well done you. Yeah, thanks, man. <laughs> Always a pleasure. All right, my friend. We'll catch up soon. All right, take care. Okay, so there you have it. There's a lot in there. For some of you who didn't get grips, full grips with how this EU ECS system works, go back to the previous Lawson Seal interviews and the others I did around carbon, because I think it's very important for people to understand. But as you can see, Lawson thinks the structural supply issues remain, the demand issues remain, um, and that that drives the price higher over time. I thought it was fascinating to note that with all of the worst case news, the market basically traded sideways and the next leg is likely to come. So fascinating from a price perspective, also really fascinating to see these worlds combine, which is the carbon world and the tokenized world. And here, um, Lawson is trying to disrupt a much broader thing, is how do we actually integrate these carbon allowances in a way that we can invest in them, but also 
implement them into various other parts of this kind of crypto ecosystem to make it so everybody can use this to start offsetting and doing good. It's a really, really interesting mechanism. And I think it's going to be something to watch. So I hope you got a lot out of it. I certainly did. Hey there, revolutionaries. To join a community sharing insights like you just watched, head over to realvision.com. There you will get unbiased insights and exclusive access to the very best, brightest, and biggest names in finance. Be a part of our community of lifelong learners. See you there.